at around 6 p.m. on Friday, February 24th, 1978, my first birthday. Five men left the Yuba County area in California to attend a college basketball game in nearby Chico. Their favorite UC Davis team were on the ticket that night, and despite being just one day away from a big basketball tournament of their own, they decided it was worth the 55-mile or 88-kilometer trip to catch the last game of the season. Bill Sterling, Jack Hewitt, who went by Jackie, Ted Weir, Jack Madruga, and Gary Mathias had driven the route several times before. But this time, they would never make it home. Forty-five years later, the truth of what happened that night remains a mystery. Even though the men ranged in age from 24 to 32, they referred to themselves as the boys. The boys were members of a basketball team known as the Gateway Gators. The team was coordinated by the Gateway Project, which was a local organization working to support those in the community living with disabilities or mental illness. Four of the men were considered to be intellectually disabled, while Gary had a diagnosis of schizophrenia. Jack, Ted, Bill, and Jackie had been friends for years while Gary had only recently joined their group after leaving the military. The Gators were a successful team, so much so that they were scheduled to take part in the Special Olympic Basketball Tournament on February 25th, just one day after they watched the UC Davis game. If they had won the tournament, they would have gained entry to the statewide Special Olympics event in Los Angeles, a long-held dream for all five men. Despite their excitement for the upcoming tournament the next day, the group decided they could watch the game in Chico and still get enough rest once they arrived home. So just before 6 p.m., they piled into Jack's two-door 1969 Mercury Montego and drove off into the night. After watching the game, they got back into the car, picked up some snacks at a nearby convenience store, and by 10 p.m., they were on the road again. It was around midnight when the mothers of the five friends began to worry. It wasn't like their sons to stay out late, and it was very unusual for them to not have checked in if their plans had changed. The women called each other to check for any updates, but no one had heard from their sons. By the early hours of the next morning, friends and family of the boys were searching the highways connecting Yuba County and Chico. At 8 p.m. on Saturday evening, Jack's mother officially reported them missing to the police. Here's what we know about the men who would come to be known as the Yuba County Five. Theodore Earl Weir, who went by Ted, was born on May 26, 1946 in Prescott, Arizona as the third of what would become five children. All the way into adulthood, he was known for his fun-loving nature and kindness. From the minute he was born, Ted's parents knew there was something different about him. It wasn't just the fact that he was born without knee joints. There was something about the way he looked and developed that led his family to label him as very slow. Ted was born during a time when there was little knowledge or understanding of developmental conditions such as intellectual disabilities, autism spectrum disorders, or cerebral palsy. During the 1950s to the 1970s, societal acceptance of such conditions was extremely limited. Parents often had to navigate the challenges of raising a child with developmental differences with little support or guidance. It was only in the years after Ted's death that his family came to understand some of the signs which might have explained why he was how he was. His ability to recall extremely specific facts, dates, and events may have indicated he was on the autism spectrum as well as his lack of awareness of social norms. For example, he would gleefully wave at strangers and would become upset if they didn't wave back. He also had very little sense of danger. In one situation, he was awoken in the middle of the night by his brother because the house was on fire and smoke was filling their bedroom. Ted saw the smoke and then told his brother he needed to get a good sleep because he had to work the next morning. His joyful and innocent outlook on the world meant Ted could easily be manipulated or persuaded by people who appeared to be friendly. 
While his mind let him down academically, Ted's strong body more than made up for it when it came to sports. Being born without knee joints didn't slow him down, and he was a keen walker and cyclist. At school, he was known for being able to throw a football half a mile, and he held the record for the longest softball throw at his school, which his family believes was somewhere in the vicinity of 200 feet or 60 meters. When it came time to graduate from high school, Ted had not earned enough credits during the year, so he enrolled in night classes to gain his diploma, which he achieved several months after his peers. After school, he worked odd jobs as a janitor, manning a snack counter, and in the months before his death, he worked as a laborer for Pacific Gas and Electric. Ted spent his spare time bowling, roller skating, walking, dancing, and of course, playing basketball. He didn't drink alcohol because it gave him headaches, but he loved attending parties and dancing with his friends. He was always well presented and meticulous with his personal hygiene. Jack Madruga was born on June 18, 1947 in Marysville, California as the youngest of four children. His early years were spent with his parents and siblings on the Madruga Ranch where they raised cows and chickens. When he was 11 years old, Jack's father died, leaving his mother to support her young family alone. Jack was known as a quiet and kind individual, with others referring to him as introverted. His family nickname was Doc due to his love of the classic line from Bugs Bunny, What's up, Doc? Along with his siblings and cousins, Jack loved all kinds of sports, but especially basketball and baseball. Given that his childhood was spent living in the great outdoors, it's no surprise that he also loved camping, fishing, and hiking. Jack seemed to make friends easily, but he struggled with his schoolwork. Just like Ted, Jack didn't have enough credits to graduate high school with his peers, but he worked hard to eventually achieve his diploma and enroll in community college. Sadly, before he got to live his college dreams, Jack was drafted into the military. He spent two years serving in Vietnam and West Germany before being honorably discharged in 1968. The reason for his discharge was noted as physical or mental conditions which would prohibit him from performing his duties properly. When Jack returned home from his military service, he moved back in with his mother and immediately put the money he earned towards his dream vehicle, a 1969 two-door Mercury Montego sedan in light blue. It was his pride and joy. When he began hanging out with the boys, he was deemed the official driver of the group. He would gladly give anyone a ride in the Mercury so long as no beer was consumed inside and no one told him how to drive. Sometime after his discharge from the military, his mother encouraged him to seek support from mental health services at a local facility. His file noted that he was a withdrawn and shy person who needed guidance in his life. By 1975, he had stopped seeing the psychologist and was instead participating in the variety of programs run by the Gateway Project. He got a job as a dishwasher where he worked alongside Bill Sterling until they were both terminated when the company upgraded its equipment. After that, Jack began to receive unemployment compensation. William Lee Sterling was always known as Bill to his friends. He was born on April 5, 1949 in Marysville as one of four children. Like Jack and Ted, Bill was known as a kind and gentle person. Very little is known about Bill's early years due to his reluctance of his loved ones to give any interviews after his death. However, Bill's police file notes that his mother said he spent time in two mental health facilities between the ages of 8 and 19. She stated that the reason for his institutionalization was that he had issues with hyperactivity and he was seen as a danger to others if they got in his way or tried to stop him. When those issues came to light, his family decided that sending him away would keep him and others safe. It was during one of those stays that Bill was involved in a violent confrontation with a fellow patient. Reports about the incident claim that if a staff member hadn't intervened, Bill possibly would have killed the patient. However, Bill's mother believes that the subject of her son's fury had sexually harassed or assaulted him during his stay. As a result of the incident, Bill was isolated from the other patients, but he was never charged with a crime. Since the age of 19, Bill lived with his parents and there were no further reports of violence. Bill graduated from high school and began working at a restaurant near Beale Air Force Base sometime around 1970. His mother would later tell investigators that he would drink and party with the Air Force personnel and they would take advantage of him because they didn't think he was bright. After several incidents like that, she encouraged him to quit his job. 
That's when he got the job washing dishes alongside Jack Madruga until they were both let go. Bill enjoyed 10-pin bowling, and alongside being a member of the Gateway basketball team, he was also a member of a bowling league known as the Pin Pickers. He loved other sports too, and would often join Ted, Jack, and Jackie in games of miniature golf. Just like Ted, he loved to walk long distances and would often go on 9-mile or 14-kilometer walks just for fun. Jack Charles Hewitt Jr. was born in Eureka, California on March 29, 1953 as the oldest of what would become four children. Given his father shared the same name, he was always known as Jackie to his family. At around the age of two, Jackie's father returned from a two-year deployment with the military and met his son for the first time. He immediately recalled there was something wrong with this boy. When Jackie was examined by a doctor, his parents were told that he was retarded, which was typical language for the time. That's no longer an acceptable term for a person with learning or developmental disabilities. Despite the diagnosis, they decided to raise him just the same as their other children. He did everything his siblings did, from hunting to fishing and camping. On top of his mental challenges, Jackie also struggled with asthma, which severely affected his ability to participate in sports. Doctors advised his parents that the best solution was to live somewhere warmer, and in 1969, the family sold their home and moved from cooler coastal Eureka to Marysville, which is situated further inland. At school, Jackie was enrolled in a special education program. He couldn't write legibly, and he had a speech impediment which made him hard to understand, but he enjoyed classes and being around his school friends. Like Ted, what Jackie lacked in academics, he made up for with physicality. He loved sports and made money by mowing lawns and working odd jobs. He enjoyed roller skating, mini golf, bowling, and basketball. He was extremely proud to have participated in the Special Olympics and had won silver medals in the senior basketball division. In 1970, his life changed for the better when he met Ted Weir. The pair became inseparable, and when they learned about the Gateway program, they enrolled together. Jackie's siblings would later say that Ted was also his protector. Ted and Jackie also got jobs together with the gas and electric company through the Gateway project. When Jackie had enough money saved, he bought himself a Yamaha motorcycle. Gary Dale Mathias was born on October 15, 1952 in Scotia, California as the oldest of four children. He is perhaps the most negatively viewed member of the Yuba County Five thanks mostly to his diagnosis of schizophrenia, but also due to his criminal record in the years prior to the disappearances. Gary's parents divorced when he was a young child and he was largely raised by his mother and stepfather. He was a typical mischievous and adventurous child who loved to play superheroes and rough-and-tumble games. There were several serious incidents when he was young, including during a game of Superman where he jumped off a roof and broke both his legs, and another when he leapt from the door of a moving vehicle. As a teenager, Gary was the lead singer in a rock and roll band, which went on to win a Battle of the Bands competition. He was also a gifted football player and confident ladies' man with several girlfriends during high school. Everything about those early teenage years was pretty typical, until Gary was introduced to drugs. That's when his parents noticed he seemed more unsettled and disobedient. During an incident when Gary was a teenager, he admitted himself to the hospital after experimenting with hallucinogens. After graduation in 1971, Gary enlisted in the military and was deployed to West Germany. However, his superiors suspected he was under the influence of drug, and after a medical assessment, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia. Schizophrenia typically manifests in men during late adolescence to early adulthood between the ages of 16 and 30. This is a slightly younger age compared to women who are usually diagnosed in their early to mid-20s. Symptoms of schizophrenia are broadly categorized into three main groups. Positive symptoms, negative symptoms, and cognitive symptoms. Positive symptoms are things like hallucinations and delusions. These are the most typical symptoms the general public associates with schizophrenia. Negative symptoms include withdrawal or lack of motivation and the appearance of a lack of emotion. Cognitive symptoms affect how the person processes thoughts and experiences. Gary was sent to an army hospital for treatment of his drug use, and in 1973, he was discharged from the military. 
When Gary returned home, his family noticed that he wasn't the same person who had left two years earlier. Despite his diagnosis, he wasn't medicated, and over the following months and years, his condition progressively worsened. The onset of schizophrenia is often gradual, and early signs can be difficult to distinguish from typical adolescent behavior. That's how it was for Gary. It was only after the diagnosis that his early teenage years and childhood misbehavior were seen in a new light. In the years before Gary enlisted, he had accumulated a short juvenile record. In one incident, he was investigated for pulling stop signs as well as being suspected of involvement in some local burglaries. He was also involved in a physical confrontation during his time in the military. He was never arrested or charged with any crimes in relation to those incidents, though. After the physical altercation, the military sent Gary to an army hospital, but he absconded and walked 130 miles or 200 kilometers back to his parents' home where he stayed for a couple of weeks. He was only found by the military after a local resident contacted the sheriff's department to report an attempted sexual assault on February 3, 1973. That night, Gary had visited a friend to watch television. He told his friend he was going to the bathroom, but when he didn't return, the friend went looking for him. He found Gary on top of his wife in bed, fondling her breasts. Later that day, the police attempted to question Gary at his parents' home, but he refused to speak without his lawyer present. He was arrested and taken to jail where he later assaulted an officer. When asked why he punched the officer in the face, he reportedly stated, quote, I've been in the army and I don't like it, and I thought if I hit a cop, maybe they'd let me out. He pleaded guilty to battery of a police officer and the attempted sexual assault charges were dropped. For his crime, he was sentenced to six months in county jail. He also got his wish and was discharged from the military. Later that year, he was named as a prowler at the homes of local residents. The following year, he was admitted to a state hospital for psychiatric treatment, but once again he escaped and returned home. He was also arrested for driving a sedan without headlights or taillights, which had been involved in a hit-and-run. In 1975, Gary enrolled at Yuba College against his parents' advice. They were concerned he wouldn't be able to keep up with the coursework. They were right, and he ended up failing his classes. Later that year, he was in trouble again after breaking into a couple's home in the middle of the night. During that incident, he ranted that he was looking for Satan because he had his ring. He also claimed that the voices in his head told him to go there and he didn't mean to harm anyone. Then he asked the officers to send him to jail because he had nowhere else to go. Thankfully, the officers identified that Gary was struggling with his mental health and he was sent to a local hospital instead. In another incident, he was found resting on the ground at a cemetery ranting about Satan, and in another, he stole a vehicle from outside a local mental health clinic. Finally, after years of having little to no support to manage his condition, Gary was put on a medication regimen which eliminated the hallucinations and voices which had been affecting him so deeply. It was a tentative time. A single missed dose would result in Gary becoming irrational and withdrawn again. Before his disappearance, things were finally looking up for Gary. He joined the Gateway Project and got a part-time job mowing lawns. He had solid and reliable friends in the boys, and with the right support, he was going to put the wrongs of his past behind him. But Gary never got a chance to do that, because a few short months later, he became one of the Yuba County Five. Once officials became aware of the five missing men, they started the investigation by taking a look at the beginning of their story, the night the men disappeared. The boys left Yuba City at around 6 p.m. for a drive that would take just over an hour. Tip-off for the UC Davis tournament was at 7.45 p.m. After watching a nail-biting game where their favorite team won by a final score of 98-86, the men left the arena just before 10 p.m. To celebrate the win, they stopped at a nearby convenience store for snacks. The store was closing, and the cashier would later recall how strange it was that men their age would buy such an abnormal amount of junk food. There were Snickers bars, a Marathon bar, a lemon pie, a Hostess cherry pie, a quart of milk, and one bottle of Pepsi. After leaving the store, they took Highway 99 out of Chico. If they had continued on that road, it would have sent them directly back to Yuba City. Instead, Jack's car ended up on the Oroville-Quincy Highway, leading northeast into the Plumas National Forest. 
That section of highway was unpaved in spots as well as being located at the foothills of the Sierra Nevada. It was February, and at that time of year, it meant they were driving directly into potential snowfall. Jack's vehicle then veered off the main road and onto a dirt road. The temperature in Butte County on the night of the men's disappearance was near freezing, and snowdrifts in the area measured from 10 to 12 feet, or 3 to 3.6 meters. None of the boys were dressed for winter. When they left home, the weather had been cold but pleasant, and most were wearing a variation of short-sleeved shirts, jeans, a light jacket, and tennis shoes. By midnight, several of the men's mothers became concerned that they hadn't returned from their drive or called to say they would be late. When they called each other and confirmed that none of them had come home, they immediately knew something was wrong. By the early hours of Saturday morning, they were out driving the highways connecting Yuba City to Chico. They never could have imagined their sons had been heading in the opposite direction. By mid-morning, Jack Madruga's mother was ready to report the boys missing, but she was told to wait 24 hours before making a report. At 8 p.m. that night, she called the Yuba County Sheriff's Department and reported that five adult men with disabilities were missing and had not been seen by their family since 6 p.m. the previous evening. Bill Sterling's parents also reported him missing to the Sutter County Sheriff's Department as his address was outside the Yuba County line. With two separate reports filed, a notification about the missing men was forwarded to neighboring Placer County and the Highway Patrol in Chico and Sacramento. It's important to note some specific characteristics of the men which make their disappearance that much more peculiar. Ted always went to bed at the exact same time. Jack, the driver, was known to drive from point A to point B by the most direct route possible, and he hated it if any of his passengers wanted to alter the course. Most of the men had a known fear of the dark and of the cold. In short, it was late, they drove in a direction opposite to home on an unknown section of road, in the dark and into the snow. All of these factors made the path they had driven that night even more out of character for the boys. The story of the missing men was widely covered in the California news media. In a sad sign of the times, the men were repeatedly referred to as retarded in these reports. On the one hand, the use of the word might have been intended to garner some additional urgency to members of the public who had information about the men. But the other, perhaps unintended consequence was that it almost immediately gave readers the impression that the men had become lost because of their disabilities and they shouldn't have been allowed out at night. When family members were asked to comment on the disappearance, they all repeated that the men were largely independent and functioned well in society with support. The families of the missing men pooled funds to offer a $1,000 reward, or about $5,000 in today's money, to anyone with information about the boys. Officials also announced a dedicated tip line and several potential sightings were explored and eliminated. On Monday, February 27th, Willard Burris of the U.S. National Forest Service was marking timber in the Plumas National Forest when he noticed an abandoned Mercury Montego. He was parked in the middle of the road with fresh snowfall surrounding the vehicle. At first, he didn't pay much notice to the car because the area was popular for snowmobilers and hikers during the winter. But the following day, he became aware that the vehicle matched the description of a vehicle belonging to a member of a missing group of men. At 7.28 p.m. on Tuesday, the sighting was reported to the Yuba County Sheriff's Department with confirmation that the plates matched Jack Madruga's missing vehicle. Within the hour, searchers from Yuba and Butte counties were heading into the mountains to examine the vehicle. It was located 60 miles or 96 kilometers in the opposite direction to where the men should have been heading if they had been driving home. When officials arrived at the vehicle, they made some interesting findings. Firstly, the car was abandoned with no sign of any of the five men. Secondly, it appeared to be in good driving condition. It hadn't broken down or crashed, and it had plenty of fuel in the tank. The keys were not in the vehicle, but it started immediately when it was hotwired by officers. The wheels were only slightly embedded in the snow, enough that the car was technically stuck but easily removed. Inside the vehicle, officers found a milk carton, Pepsi bottle, and candy wrappers as well as a program from the UC Davis basketball game with handwritten notes on it. There were also a number of maps found inside the car. 
Almost as soon as the discovery of the Montego was announced to the public, a man came forward claiming he had seen the men on the dirt road the night they had disappeared. A local man by the name of Joseph Schoen said he had spent Friday night just feet from where the Montego was found a few days later. He was driving a Volkswagen Beetle, which became stuck in the snow. When he attempted to free the car, he suffered a heart attack. He couldn't call for help, so he decided to rest inside his car. At around 11 p.m., he heard the Montego pull onto the road and stop nearby. He called out for help, and he heard the passengers in the car get out and close the door. But they didn't say anything, and they didn't come over to his vehicle. He called out again, but they never responded, and he heard what he believed were the sounds of them heading into the forest. He stayed in his vehicle until the early hours before walking to a local restaurant and organizing a ride home. The fact the investigators now had a definitive sighting of the men from that night should have come as a relief. But when they took a closer look at the man who provided the report, it was clear he wasn't as reliable a witness as they might have hoped. Joseph was in his 50s and lived in the Berry Creek area just outside the boundaries of the Plumas National Forest. He had a long history of drunk driving, public intoxication, and theft. Those who knew Joseph told officers he was a bullshit artist and a pathological liar who would spin stories to get himself out of trouble or get them to part with their hard-earned cash. Joseph would also regularly claim he had just had a heart attack to elicit sympathy and get free help. Still, the story of the broken-down beetle checked out when his wife and friends said they had helped get it unstuck the following day. And there was the fact Joseph had contacted police from his hospital bed where he was recovering from a suspected heart attack. Despite some parts of Joseph's story adding up, there were a number of discrepancies in the timeline and in his wife's recollection of the sequence of events regarding the beetle and the Montego. So Joseph was interviewed a second time. He added further details to his recollection of the night, including the presence of a rusted pickup truck parked behind the Montego, and claims that the passengers from the vehicle shone flashlights into his car. He also mentioned the presence of a woman and a baby, though he was inconsistent in his recollection about whether they were in the truck or the Montego. To this day, those with insight into the case are split on whether Joseph's story is legit or fabricated, or a bit of both. There are several witnesses who saw the Montego parked on the road on the Saturday before the men were reported missing. Some of those witnesses recalled seeing the broken-down VW Beetle parked not far from it, but the details of any interaction between Joseph and the boys or the presence of a rusted pickup truck or a woman and a baby are impossible to confirm with any certainty given the unreliability of the witness. During subsequent conversations that Joseph had with families of the missing men, his account varied even further. Eventually, he was asked to undergo a polygraph, but his doctor said the stress of the test might trigger another heart attack, so he refused. Regardless of the surrounding details, it does seem clear that the men left the vehicle for some unknown reason and headed into the snowy forest. Logically, the location of the vehicle became the starting point for a significant search and rescue operation which began at 9.15pm on the same day the car was discovered. The area surrounding the Montego was made up of rugged and bushy terrain. By the following day, March 1st, newspaper reports stated that the search team had covered a 5-mile or 8-kilometer radius from the Mercury. Along with the ground crew, the search team had access to snowmobiles, a snowcat, and four-wheel drive vehicles. There was some hope that the men might have made it to one of the many cabins located in the Plumas National Forest, but no trace of the missing men was found in the forest or the canyon or any of the nearby cabins the searchers visited. Over the coming days, helicopters, dogs, and farmers on horseback joined the search. Others set up tents in strategic locations in the hope that one of the men might stumble upon them, but the operation was wound back when heavy rain and hail descended on the region. As it neared one week since the men were last seen, snowfall in the area reached up to 8 feet or 2.5 meters, with snowdrifts reported to be nearly 15 feet or 4.5 meters deep. That resulted in search efforts being called off until the weather improved. During the search period, several volunteers were hospitalized for exhaustion and pneumonia due to the challenging conditions. Officers also had to explore the possibility that the men had never entered the forest at all. 
Maybe they had walked towards the same restaurant Joseph had gone to after his heart attack and made their way to another location. Or worse yet, there was always the possibility that foul play was involved. By the first days of March, hopes of finding the boys alive were fading. The families had increased their reward money to $2,600 or $11,000 in today's money, but still none of the tips coming in through the dedicated phone line ever amounted to anything. On March 9th, 15 days after the men were last seen, the ground search was called off and authorities announced they would be focusing on lines of inquiry which were fueled by tips from the public. Calls were coming through thick and fast regarding sightings of the boys. There was a woman who claimed to see the men at a diner, and another who saw them at a convenience store. Then there was a report that they had all run off to join a commune or to escape their families. And just like with any high-profile case, there were the psychics and conspiracy theorists who came out of the woodwork to declare they had been shown the location of the group or had evidence of the government's involvement in their disappearance. When four strips of orange cloth were discovered in the forest on March 19th, interest in the case reignited. The reward money increased to $3,500 and then to $5,000, about $23,000 in today's money. More tips came in and more sightings were explored, but none resulted in any legitimate new leads. The fabric strips were never definitively linked to the missing men. With little information to go on and search efforts being hampered by the snowy conditions, the trail leading to the men went cold. A month went by, and then two and three. By the time four months had passed, the public was resigned to the fact the men had met with foul play or become lost in the snowy mountains. Regardless of what the newspapers were saying, the families of the men still held out hope. They gave interviews and put up posters in between their own foot searches in the National Forest. But their efforts were in vain, and their hope was stolen on Sunday, June 4th, 1978, nearly four months after the missing men were last seen. That day, Lauren Koch and his son Roger joined a friend for a motorcycle ride from Oroville to Quincy. The weather was pleasant and the ride was easy, until they gained altitude and hit snowdrifts in the foothills of the Plumas National Forest. Given the time of year, the men hadn't been expecting snow, but they continued on anyway until they reached a section of road which was blocked by a fallen tree in deep snow. One of the group decided they should backtrack to the Daniel Zink campground which they had passed earlier. They hoped to find a U.S. Forest Service member inside one of the trailers on site who would be able to tell them which road to take to avoid more obstacles. What they found instead was nothing short of horrific. It was the smell that got them first. It was overpowering, and it appeared to originate from one of the trailers located at the park. That same trailer had a broken window, and when they looked inside, they could see it had been recently occupied. The sheets on the bunks were disheveled, and dishes were piled high on the bench. And then, they found the origin of the smell. On the bottom bunk, closest to the broken window, was the body of a man with a sheet pulled up to his neck. One of the men would later state, quote, It appeared he just laid down and went to sleep. The men immediately left the campground and drove to a local restaurant where they notified the police about what they had found. Officers were initially skeptical about the men's discovery, but later that evening they sent a deputy to take a closer look. When they confirmed that there was indeed a decomposed body inside the trailer, the Daniel Zink campground officially became a crime scene. The Daniel Zink campground is located roughly 12 miles or 19 kilometers by road to the northeast of where the Mercury Montego was found. As the crow flies, that distance was just five miles. When investigators from Yuba County took their first look at the body in the bed, it was so decomposed that the face was unidentifiable. However, when they pulled back the sheets, the lead officer recognized the clothes as being what Ted Weir had reportedly been wearing on the night the men disappeared. Ted's body provided the first trace of what had happened to the men that night, but the discovery would ultimately prompt more questions than answers. It was apparent that Ted had not died on the night the group disappeared. He was found with a full beard and long curly hair, despite being clean-shaven with a fresh haircut when he went missing. The frail size of his remains also indicated he had lost a significant amount of weight prior to his death. The medical examiner put that number at a loss of 100 pounds or 45 kilograms. Ted had frostbite on both feet and was missing five toes. 
He also had gangrene in the veins of his leg, which indicated serious blood poisoning. An autopsy confirmed he had died from starvation and exposure in what would have been a slow and painful death. Outside of the fact that Ted had been missing for nearly four months, the circumstances surrounding his cause of death were highly confusing, mostly because the trailer was fully stocked with several months of supplies, including food and fuel for heating, as well as matches, a generator, and blankets. There were a number of empty cans of food found inside and outside the trailer, but there was no indication a fire or heating source had been utilized by Ted at any point. Ted's shoes were missing, but strangely, Gary's shoes were found inside the trailer. It was clear Ted had lived in the trailer for some period of time after the night they all disappeared. The medical examiner estimated he had survived somewhere between 8 and 13 weeks after the men went missing. The discovery of Gary's shoes in the trailer, as well as notes written in Gary's handwriting, indicated he had been in the trailer with Ted at some point, but he and the other three missing men were nowhere to be found when the trailer was examined. While investigators picked apart the evidence in the trailer, several officers searched the area surrounding the Daniels Inc. campground. Half a mile to the northeast of the trailer, they found some blankets and a flashlight which originated from the Forest Service accommodations. Officials would later state they believed that during Ted's time in the trailer, he went out in search of his friends and left the supplies there in case they returned to the area. The discovery of Ted's remains gave investigators the first lead since the vehicle had been found, and naturally, it prompted a new search operation. Now that the worst of the snow had melted, authorities were able to more closely examine the landscape which separated the trailer from the location of the vehicle. The following day, the remains of Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling were found three miles from the Daniel Zink campground. Jack was found near a stream in a state of advanced decomposition. His remains appeared to have been picked at by animals. Just like with Ted, he was identified based on the clothing he was found in, matching what he was wearing the night he was last seen, as well as the keys to the Montego being in his pocket. Across the road from Jack and down an embankment was the body of Bill Sterling. He too was badly decomposed and his remains had been scattered by animals. He was wearing the same clothing as the night of his disappearance. Both men were determined to have died from exposure. On June 7th, the remains of Jackie Hewitt were found by his father just a quarter mile or 400 meters from the Forest Service trailer. Like Jack and Bill, all that remained were a pile of bones which were scattered across a hundred yards. His jacket and pants were found nearby. Despite extensive searches over several months, the remains of Gary Mathias have never been found. Finding the bodies of four of the five missing men should have provided some answers as to what happened on the night of February 24, 1978, but the circumstances surrounding the discoveries only left more questions. Like, why did Jack drive his vehicle in the opposite direction to home and then up into the mountains? Why did five guys who didn't like the cold or the dark then get out of the relative comfort, warmth, and safety of their car to walk in the snow? And if the men traveled from the car to the Daniel Zink campground by the most direct route, it would have taken them through five miles of treacherous terrain, including elevations of three to 5,000 feet. If they walked along the road, it would have been 15 miles of snowed-out track with multiple turns and changes in direction, and they supposedly did all of that in tennis shoes with no maps, no equipment, in the dark, and during a period of very heavy snow. There was also the question as to why the trailers had never been visited during the initial search. Tragically, while the Daniel Zink campground was a known location, only a few people were aware of the presence of the trailers. One of those people had apparently advised the search team about the trailers at the campground, but that information was either never passed on or overlooked. In the wake of the discovery of four bodies, many media commentators decided that in order to be able to make sense of what had happened to the men, the story needed a villain. The person who was easiest to label as the bad guy was the only member of the group who was actually diagnosed with a condition, Gary. Based on Gary's criminal history and schizophrenia, many articles were written blaming the death solely on him. Some said he wanted to visit friends in a town east of Orville, so he made Jack change direction and head that way. But that doesn't line up with Jack being a point A to point B driver, or with Ted's requirement that he get to bed at the same time every night. 
The friends in question hadn't seen Gary for many months, so him randomly deciding to visit them when they had an important tournament the next day just didn't add up. Others claimed Gary had simply had a psychotic episode and convinced the men to drive into the mountains where they died of exposure. The families of the men were consistent in their belief that they would have never driven up into the mountains unless they were forced. Jack Madruga's mother stated, quote, There was some force that made them go up there. They wouldn't have fled off in the woods like a bunch of quail. We know good and well that somebody made them do it. We can't visualize someone getting the upper hand on those five men, but we know it must have been. The official line is that the men simply got lost while driving, and when they thought the car was stuck, they decided to walk for help, but ended up lost in the forest. They believe Jack and Bill died of hypothermia during the walk to the trailer, while the other three men made it safely. They stayed there until Ted died from hypothermia and the blood infection caused by his frostbitten toes. Once he was dead, Jackie and Gary attempted to make their way back down the mountain, but died without making it to safety. Sadly, we will likely never know what truly happened to the Yuba County Five. Forty-five years have gone by with many of their family members and friends passing away. That passage of time and the fading of memories makes the likelihood of uncovering new significant details increasingly slim. There have been many unconfirmed sightings of Gary over the years as well as several sets of remains being found in the Plumas National Forest, but none belong to Gary. If you want to know more about this case and the many layers of confusing evidence to form your own opinion, I highly recommend Tony Wright's book, Things Aren't Right, The Disappearance of the Yuba County Five. If you're a fan of true crime, hit subscribe and turn on notifications so you don't miss an episode. You can also hit like or leave us a comment. You can check out our other show, Somewhere Sinister, on YouTube or anywhere that you listen to podcasts. If you'd like to support the show, check out our merchandise at thisismonsters.com. The link is in the description. Thanks again, and be safe.